It's my pleasure to introduce a panel on uh, projects of significance. Project of national, national significance. Yes, yeah. that's quite a, quite a, uh, I don't know, that's quite a name. Um, projects of national significance um, uh, from the Administration on Community Living. And uh, uh, I'm pleased to have all these folks. This is our new approach to have specific topics each year. Um, we may hear from you guys in the years to come. Maybe not as full two sessions, but uh, other sessions later on, as you guys maybe like the feds, you know, give us updates on what you're doing in the coming years. But we're happy to have you here this year and uh, look forward to hearing what you have to say. I'll turn it over to Kathy. Thank you. I'm from ACL, but I'm not for night like you know, it's a almost created in 2011 when we together the administration on aging and the administration of developmental disabilities um, with a focus of community living um, that is our organization trust as you can see, night lights on. Night on the right. And then a administration on disabilities. And until that, that AIDD and end of that there's projects of national significance and all data collection branches for under that also, in AIDD, there are state councils on, dis on development of disabilities, protection and advocacy centers and university centers for excellence and university of New Hampshire is one of them. The projects of National Significance focus on the most pressing issues that affect people with ITD and their families. The data collection projects for under that, that but the data collection helps all the other programs in setting their priorities 
based on the data. <clears throat> And, you know, there are three data collection for the state of the states, which Amy Lewis, she was presidential information system, which there we was in the access to integrated employment head up by John Butterworth. Oh. This is what I really want to show you is who uses this data. Um, like I said, the counters and the user and the P and H use it. <coughs> to put forth the plan that has to be approved by us for what they are going to do to improve their community. Uh, the President's Committee for People with Intellectual Disabilities writes a report to the President and they use this data. Congress uses the data. Um, Representative from these projects testify before Congress and committees. They do not love you. Oh, money, but the info. Oh. <laughs> like recently, self advocates and family members use the data that. The projects in the last five years have really tried to make the data more usable and digestible with infographics and other pictures of me, the media use the data to provide on information to see how lives are changing. Providers may be giving them data, but they also use it to compare themselves with each other 
to see. Oh, they are doing it with art for the undo. I like to indigenous. I, I did not ask who was speaking, I but I think Amy is speaking. So thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you, Kathy, for the introduction, and thank you, Andrew and Karen and the rest of the team for the invitation to participate this year. We're really excited to be here and share some of the work that we have been doing, um, well, some of us have been doing longer than others um, with all of you today. Um, I'm going to quickly introduce the project and share some very preliminary data that we have, as well as if we have time, hopefully, um, I will share with you how you can act access the data. So to start, again, my name is Amy Lulinski, and I'm here representing the State of the States and in Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, which is a project of national significance housed at the Coleman Institute for Cognitive Disabilities, which is located at the University of Colorado. This quote by uh, former Vice President Joe Biden, I think, encapsulates the heart of this project. Um, when he stated, don't tell me what you value, show me your budget and I'll tell you what you value. Uh, as I said, this very much encapsulates the heart of this project as we track uh, fin public um, financial uh, data on services and supports for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in the United States. Um, so this study has been looking at public spending on both congregate and community-based settings for people who have IDD. Um, it's longitudinal. Uh, we've been collecting data since the project started in 1982 and has data going back to 1977. So with the completion of this year's data collection, we will have 40 years worth of data um, to look at those trends over time. Um, it's nationwide. We collect data from each of the 50 states and the District of Columbia, which is really great because not only does it allow us to look at how the nation is doing as a whole, but it also allows states to compare themselves um, to one another, which is particularly important for those that um, when you're looking at Medicaid-funded services, such each state is able to determine uh, how they set those services up. Um, and finally, um, it's comparative. So we can compare states, we can compare regions um, across those times. So in other words, we follow the money. Um, as we already said, or as was alluded to, this project is funded by the Administration on uh, Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities as a project of national significance. Um, and it's also supported by the University of Colorado uh, Department of Psychiatry. This study is usually published every other year, um, and it includes two fiscal years in each publication. The latest edition, which is the 11th, uh, came out in 2017. We are in the process of completing analysis of data from uh, fiscal years 16, 17, are in currently uh, in preparation for publication later this year. Um, there is There are two copies of the 11th edition out on the table. Uh, it will not hurt my feelings if I don't have to take those home with me, um, so please grab one if there's still any left. So we collect um, data from each of the 50 states and the District of Columbia, like I already said. Uh, but we also collect secondary data from a number of entities, including the U.S. Census Bureau, um, Social Security Statistical Supplements, Bureau of Economic <coughs> Analysis, et cetera. So we do rely on primary data in addition to the secondary data that I just mentioned. This is probably quite small um, for you to be able to see from there, but this just gives you an idea of the number of variables that we collect. So there are two key areas in which how we collect our data on spending. Um, we look at money, we look at dollars, and we look at the number of people. Um, so first I will address the money portion. Um, in terms of spending variables, we look at two very broad categories. We look at spending on public and spending on private 
institutional services, which are defined as those settings for 16 or more individuals. And then the second major area is we look at those community-based settings, which we define as being for 15 or fewer individuals. So this slide lists spending categories for public and private institutional settings for 16 or more people and includes federal, state, and local spending. And then here are the community-based variables and spending data, which is nearly the same as the public spending variables I just shared. Um, but this one includes home and community-based service waiver funded and related Medicaid services, which includes case management, rehab, clinical services, et cetera. Um, in addition, federal supplemental security income as well as state SSI supplemental funds are included in those costs. So as in terms of, so that was the dollars. So in terms of the people, um, we also look at the number of people receiving supports and services using similar parameters, as I mentioned, in terms of community for 15 or fewer and institutional for 16 or more. Um, we further divided up into residential setting for, uh, settings for seven or fewer, seven to 15 and 16 plus, and we also collect data on participants in day and work program. This is a little bit of a neater way to look at the variables and how we collect them. Um, just more of a visual illustration of how we collect the, the data that we collect. Um, this includes um, a box that talks about technology, which if you were here this morning, I, I alluded to a little bit and I'll mention um, in a bit, but we do um, have some technology data that we have been collecting as well. So um, before we get into the data, a word of caution, um, this data that I'm presenting is preliminary as we remain engaged in data analysis. So if you have what you see here may differ slightly from the final publication. And um, sorry, I'm just trying to get my timer to work. I like, there we go. Um, so it might change a little bit, so you've been warned. Okay. So this bar chart illustrates total, total IDD um, services adjusted spending from 1977 through fiscal year 2017. Um, there are two bars that are in red. Those are the ones I'm going to call attention to. Um, in fiscal year 2011 and fiscal year 2014. In both, we saw adjusted decreases in spending from the previous years. In fiscal year 2011, the dip was in response to the end of the American Reinvestment and Recovery Act FMAP um, increases that ended in December of 2010. Um, and those were, of course, enacted as a result of the Great Recession. Um, and as well as a 9% decrease in local funding contributed to that dip also. Moving to the second red line, in uh, fiscal year 2014, we see the drop was about a billion dollar drop and that was actually due to one state. That was due to New York State um, because they had a decrease in their federal ICI, uh, intermediate care facility funding. Their rates decreased and was a billion dollar decrease and so it caused the whole thing to shift down which was a little startling when we first started looking at it and quickly dug to figure out what's going on. So those are the two adepts counted for. Um, so there's a green line, and I'm hoping that you can see it. So the green line represents the estimated amount of total spending that would have been if we had continued on the same trajectory of the uh, annual percentage increases that we had seen in the previous 20 years. So you can see that instead of being at um, $71.6 billion in fiscal year 2017, we probably should have been closer to $79 billion if things had uh, continued to raise as they had previously. So that's one way we look at the data. We look at the total. Um, and then we like to, of course, slice and dice it because that's what we all do, right? Um, so where are these funds coming from and where are they going? So the blue piece of pie in this chart illustrates that nearly 76% of public IDD spending comes from federal, state, and local Medicaid funds, while the remaining 24% comes from other, um, state and fed, other state and federal funds. So again, the takeaway, Medicaid finances a huge amount of IDD services in the United States. The stacked bar to the right of the pie chart illustrates how the 31, or sorry, 30, yeah, 31.4 billion Medicaid dollars were spent. Nearly three quarters of it was spent on home and community-based services, almost 20% on intermediate care facilities, and 7% on those Medicaid state programs. 
This line chart offers another way to look at spending. So this is institutional versus community spending. And again, we're defining uh, institutionals for 16 or more and community is for 15 or fewer people. And we can see that in um, 2017 dollars, community spending surpassed institutional spending in 1989 and has continued to increase to $64.4 billion in fiscal year 2017, while institutional spending has dropped uh, significantly down to 7.2. Really quickly, because I know Sherry will probably go into much more detail about this, um, but we also track the number of people living in institutions, and it's not a surprise given the massive drop in the censuses that we see. Uh, this graph here, the red line is showing the peak of the institutional census in 1967. You can see it's continued to drop steadily since then, um, and it's been a 91% drop down to about 18,000 people in fiscal year 17. And if we look at uh, recent trends, and if things continue on as they have, we project that uh, in state-operated institutions will be closed by 2030 if we continue along that same um, trajectory. And following that, we also see that as those numbers and those census continue to decrease, we're seeing a greater demand for those smaller settings, which makes sense. And this pans shows us what the trends have been in previous years, as well as projected trends going forward. And we can see that in 2030, again, if, if as anticipated they close, um, we will see almost entirely everybody uh, living in settings for six or fewer. So here's another line chart. Uh, this one is looking at individual and family support and supported employment since 1986. Um, however, I want to highlight the data since 1993. Um, total, so the, um, the green line is total spending, and we can see that that has gone up. It's grown 915% since the uh, mid-80s. Supported living and personal assistance. Um, which is the blue line, um, has gone up 1,746%. That's <laughs> quite a leap that that's taken. Um, but supported employment, which is the very sad little gray line at the bottom, has barely budged at all as compared to its other counterparts, and it has only increased about 74% during that same time period. Which again highlights why the state of the science on employment yesterday was so important, because we can see this is quite quite an issue in terms of um, seeing where our priorities lie. We also take a look at caregiving families. So this chart illustrates um, the total number of uh, caregiving families. So those are families that support a family member with IDD in their household. The light blue is the total number. The dark blue at the bottom shows the proportion of families that receive formal um, state agency supports. And so what we can see looking at fiscal year 17 and the years going up to that is that a very small proportion of families are actually receiving any kind of formalized support from IDD agencies, which is meaning that the majority of families are going it alone and doing so without any formal supports. So I told you I had one slide on technology and here it is. Um, so we have been um, exploring this since around 2008, looking at um, spending by um, IDD agencies. So now, again, this is not out-of-pocket spending for um, just people you know, living in the community. This is money that DD agencies have been putting out um, for this. The red line in the graph shows us that individual support technologies such as augmentative communication systems, tablets, GPS, has risen dramatically over the past decade, um, which makes sense. We think about just our own use of smartphones, for example. I would be lost without mine. I have my calendar to-do list and map on it, phone book, et cetera. Um, Remote monitoring is picking up speed as a way to maximize independence, as we can see, um, which is illustrated by the gray line, and the blue line shows us the uptick in use of smart home technology. Um, the, like I mentioned earlier this morning, the National Association of State Develop Directors of Developmental Disability Services, NASDES, 
um, partnered with my colleague Shay Tanis um, at the Institute to do a technology survey which explored tech use by state. Um, Shay said that I, anybody who wants to contact her to get that PowerPoint can reach out to her. Her email address will be at the end of this presentation, but there is a report that is forthcoming and they hope to field another one um, beginning this spring. So another way to explore IDD spending is by looking at fiscal effort, which of course allows us to compare states while controlling for population. Um, this graph illustrates state fiscal effort in FY27, or sorry, FY17, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, FY17 in ascending order. Um, so the blue bars each represent a state, while the red bar represents the U.S. average. So we can see that we go from a low of $1.62 in Nevada up to $11.65 in Maine um, with the U.S. average right around $4.40. So I, um, according to my timer, I'm about out of time. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap up and let you know that there are a couple of ways that you can access this data. One is using our bound book, which we call our monograph. And like I said, there are a couple of them on the table out there. Um, and like I said, it's published every other year. Another way to obtain data is through our website, uh, www.stateofthestates.org. You can go there and you can um, get a state profile. So you can click on a state and be able to get just kind of a quick and dirty look at some of the variables for that state. Um, you can print it, you can cut and paste it into a presentation that you're giving, or you can reach out to us to help you do that. Um, you can also create a chart, um, and so that allows you to look at a group of variables um, uh, and, and look at them for uh, across the United States and compare variables within there. So you can also do that there as well. Um, just more ways to access to data. Um, and of course, we also do data briefs, presentations, and technical assistance. So there's a couple of data briefs that are out on the table um, for you to take a look at if you're interested. They're also available on our website. And then finally, um, here is our contact information. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. There's our email addresses. If you want that technology survey, you can email Shay Tanis. Um, and thank you for indulging me in a sneak peek of our forthcoming monograph, uh, which we plan to release this year. So hopefully I didn't go too much over my time and I will turn it over to my colleague, John. Thank you. Hi folks, we are in kind of a remarkable period for employment. Our project focuses on trends in employment services and employment outcomes and the services that wrap around that, so non-work kinds of services that people may have as, as part of building a daytime. Um, we have two pieces. We draw on a bunch of different sources of data, and most of that data is available at um, our website, statedata.info. Our monograph, which is um, published annually, is downloadable from that website. You can also build charts on that website. But like the other projects, we collect data from um, states directly on employment services and outcomes. We also use data from other secondary sources to so the Vocational Rehabilitation System, the National Core Indicators Project, which is a collaborative project of state IDD agencies, um, the National Association of State DD Directors, and Human Services Research Institute. We use data from the American Community Survey. You've seen lots of that so far here. Um, but that gives us a real life benchmark. Most of our data is service data from service systems. So it captures people who are engaged in some way with a service system. Um, the American Community Survey, even though we can't get down to our target population, gives us some benchmarks on community employment and, and what our data means. Um, and Social Security Administration and a little bit of data from the workforce development system. We also, as part of our core activities, do a variety of special projects that try to drill deeper into that data. So we've done employment first case studies, trying to understand higher performing states. We've looked at young adult outcomes and services. Um, Realworkstories.org is a storytelling website. So that's another piece of how we try to reach out to 
to multiple stakeholder groups. I usually start, I'm not going to really spend time on this because you've heard about the ACS, um, but I usually start with a benchmark. How are, how are people with disabilities faring compared to the general population? Um, and, and the relationship to poverty, I think, is always an important piece of that. But I'm going to start with um, what we know about services for, for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, this trend, integrated employment, is the green on the bottom. Um, what's striking about integrated employment is how much we've struggled to really move that bar over the years. That's not surprising when you look at our general disability data. Um, if you look at the period between 1990 and about 1999, there was a period when we were investing a lot in supported employment. There were supported employment systems change grants during that period. Supported employment was first really defined in um, the Developmental Disabilities Act in 1984 and then the Rehab Act in 1986. So you see that steady growth and then it stalls in 2000. The systems change grants stopped, state agencies started paying attention to other things, and it's not until you get down to about 2012 that we start to see an uptick happen again. The real story to me in this chart is we spend a lot of time talking about employment. We talk, spend a lot of time talking about sheltered employment. There's currently an act out that, among other things, would eliminate subminimum wage employment. Um, Facility-based work, the red part of that chart, has been going down steadily, um, particularly for the last 10 to 15 years. Um, the real story and the real challenge for us as a system is what to do with people who are in non-work services and how do we create a pathway for them to employment. Um, there's pressure on that as there is currently for employment from the CMS settings rule. It creates expectations about community engagement and employment is a critical part of CMS's message going back to, to 2011 and guidance that was issued in 2011. It's embedded in the Workforce Innovation and Opportunities Act as a priority. Um, and it's embedded in state employment first policy. And most states today have some sort of employment first policy, either at a legislative level or at, a, at an agency and operational level. There is growth. <laughs> um, since 2012, that, that line for integrated employment, the number of people in integrated employment, this is as a service. Um, has grown by about 18 percent. And I think we're actually doing better than that because one of the impacts of the settings rule and the CMS 2011 guidance is states are rethinking how they define their services and rethinking what they mean by employment. A simple example, um, up until a few years ago, the state of Maryland included volunteering as part of the service umbrella of supported employment. That's no longer true. Volunteering is not in most of our lives employment. It may be a meaningful part of our, our day. Um, but states have become stricter about what they mean by an employment outcome. That's a good thing. Um, so I actually think the growth is better than that 18% suggests. The other important part of the story, though, is how different states are. And today, um, you know, now, almost 40 years, 30 years after, after the initiation of supported employment, um, we still have this distribution across states of percent of integrated employment. So we go from a state at the very far left, which still only supports 4% of the people who get a day service of some kind in an integrated employment service, um, to the state at the right, which is Washington, which is at 86%. And Washington is a complicated story, more complicated than today, but about 60% of people who get, um, who are participating in a day service in the state of Washington are working in an integrated job. And the vast majority of those people are working in an individual competitive integrated job. Um, and about 40% even of folks that they categorize as having more significant support needs are working in a competitive integrated job. They would be the first to say, not yet with enough hours. Um, not yet with enough wages, but that's a very different benchmark. In Washington today, folks are working, folks with low levels of support need are working at about the same rate of people without disabilities. Again, not enough hours, not enough wages yet, 
but it's a very different benchmark than where states are as a whole. That variation has driven a lot of our work that surrounds this project to national significance. Um, back now, 12, 15 years ago, we started studying, uh, doing case studies of states that were um, on the higher end there, those 40 to 60 percent and higher um, states, and trying to understand what was different about them. The simple story, um, this model drives a lot of our work with states. The simple story from that is states that have better employment outcomes from their IDD system, in those states, employment is a clear priority in every piece of the system. It's a clear priority in their funding structure. It's a clear priority in their investments in training and technical assistance. It's a clear priority in the kinds of outcome data that they collect and talk about with their provider community. It's a clear priority in their investments in interagency collaboration. It's in their policy. Kind of the, the simple outcome of that set of case studies was it's a pervasive message across that system. Currently, the National Core Indicators Project suggests about 20% of all people, this is not just people who get a day service, who are supported by a state um, IDD agency are working in integrated employment. About two-thirds of those people are in competitive integrated jobs. That's really our goal. Um, and about a third of those are still in group-supported employment. That also varies a lot from state to state. There are states where two-thirds of the folks are in group-supported employment and they haven't broken out of that model of, of employment for folks yet. Um, there's visible change in the National Core Indicators Project. The percent in integrated employment has come up um, from 13% in 2011-12 to about 20% now. Time spent in the community, unpaid community activities, is slowly beginning to grow. That's consistent with the setting rule and the kinds of expectations that are embedded in the values of the setting rule. Um, time and facility-based settings, both work and non-work, are showing some decline over time. Um, this is, one of, this is one of my favorite pieces of data out of National Core Indicators because it sets one of our key challenges and that's embedded in expectations and the kinds of conversations we have with people. So of the 80% of people who aren't working, um, National Core Indicators suggests that ha almost half of those people say that they want an integrated community job. That's based on our numbers um, of people in day and employment services. That's almost 300,000 people are currently not working and say that they want to work. That's an opportunity. Um, of those people who want a job, only about 39% have a goal in their service plan. We're not listening very well yet to people. Um, and states are beginning to pay more attention to What's the role of, of um, employment in the service planning and person-centered planning process? Is there a clear policy expectation that that conversation gets had and that it gets had at a level that's deeper than are you happy in the workshop or, or even do you want a job? Whoops. Um, Amy's quote from Joe Biden um, is also relevant to employment. If employment is a high priority for states and for CMS, um, the money doesn't suggest that we're following that path very effectively. Um, about 18.8, actually in 2017, more like 20% of people are in integrated employment services. We're only spending about 13% of our day in employment service money on integrated employment. Um, Meaningful day and the broad issue of self-sufficiency, you know, these things are critical goals and values for our systems. Um, hours worked is one indicator of that. Wages is one indicator of that. We have a long ways to go. Um, across folks who are supported by IDD systems and services, only about people who are getting in individual jobs with supports are only working on average about 13 hours a week. Again, that varies a lot from a low of a state that's at about seven or eight hours a week to a high of a state that's at about 21 hours a week. States are very different in terms of 
their investments and how effectively they're achieving those outcomes. But we've, if we're going to really hit meaningful day, 13 hours a week leaves a lot of other time in your week that you've got to fill. And $100 a week is probably not going to boost you into a, a significantly different quality of life. Not that it's not meaningful, um, but we've got ways to go. Oh, that's the variation. Okay, from 5 to 21, actually. Um, Voc Rehab is an important part of this picture and an important partner in the employment process. Um, state's investment in, in meaningful collaboration with the VR system is a really critical part of their success. Um, over the last 20 years or so, um, partici participation of people with an intellectual disability in Voc Rehab has declined somewhat, and that's a concern. Um, I should say in fairness, because I'm just showing the ID trend line here, overall closures and closures into employment for the Voc Rehab system has declined some also during that period. Um, but states vary, again, significantly um, in terms of the extent to which the Voc Rehab system is engaged with folks with intellectual disabilities. So from, that's uh, probably about 5% on the very far left, a state that has very few people with intellectual disabilities engaged with their Voc Rehab system, to over 20% on the right, a state that has a really healthy engagement with this population. Um, Voc Rehab is supposed to be the first funder for employment. Um, that's in Medicaid policy. Um, kind of knowing where your state is on that continuum helps you understand a little bit about the kind of advocacy that's needed and the kind of relationship building investments that are needed. Um, work incentives, we don't, we talk a lot about benefits planning, we talk a lot about work incentives, we need to do better in these areas. Use of work incentives, in this case impairment related work expenses, has dropped steadily, leveling out a little in the last few years, but has dropped steadily from its peak. People don't use um, the work incentives that are available very often. They're complicated. They frustrate people. It takes too much accounting. Uh, you know, there are a lot of, of costs to getting engaged in the work incentives. Um, and, it, and as a result, it, te it, tends to, um, it tends to not really have a lot of value to folks on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so, like Amy, our, our website, statedata.info, is the place to go for, for data, both um, our annual report as well as kind of a, a state snapshot from that annual report, um, brief one-page state snapshots and building charts, um, and we hope you'll also visit some of our other websites um, for the, the policy work that wraps around that. So, thank you. I am Sherry Larson from the University of Minnesota. Uh, I'm the director of the Residential Information Systems Project, or RISP for short. Um, we've been going at the same as Amy for um, the first uh, national census of residential settings was done in 1977, followed up in 1982. David Braddock and Charlie Lakin were the key players then. We're all the second generation <laughs> data people in these projects. <laughs> um, so. I have a few pictures of kind of what we do in RISP. This is just a really brief summary, um, given our, uh, the time we have, but it should give you a good introduction to what you might be able to find if you were to pick up the report that's out on the table that I have plenty of copies I would love to send home with you. Um, and so the RISP project focuses on five main dim dimensions of long-term supports and services. The first one, and this was more important when we started than it is now, was is whether the state is providing the services directly to people or whether the services are being provided by a private um, provider uh, or organization within the state. And right now, 94% uh, of people who do not live with family members live in non-state um, settings. So it used to be that almost everybody who received residential supports lived in an institution and that institution was a state operated um, institution. So uh, the second domain is setting type. Uh, and this is, we have several main categories, own home, a uh, person's living in a place that they own or rent, um, family home, and that's the most dominant model of 
where people who get services live, host home or foster home, uh, group homes of all sizes and institutions. So in 2016, 58% of all people who receive services through state IDD agencies lived with a family member. Um, we'll look at the range uh, in a couple of slides. Funding authority, this is an area that is um, getting complicated really, really fast as Medicaid funding authorities expand. Um, and uh, our, our initial um, work in the risk project had fund focused on uh, Medicaid, ICF, and uh, waiver-funded services. And now we are not able to tell the story about how people are receiving services or what funding authority uh, without taking into account a state plan, home and community-based services, uh, and a number of other um, different forms of services. So um, the, the highlight out of that area, 92% right now of all waiver plus ICF recipients are getting home and community-based services rather than living institutions. The fourth dimension is setting size, and we uh, are in the same categories that Amy uses. We have one to three, four to six, seven to 15, and 16 or more people with intellectual disabilities living in the same um, home or uh, residential settings. Um, and we are currently at the place where 82% of all people who don't live with a family member live in a setting of six or fewer people. So uh, Kathy talked about why the risk data might be helpful to you, so I'm going to skip right past that slide and move on to um, one of the pieces that we've been developing uh, in more detail over the last several years, um, and which is trying to understand um, prevalence rates for intellectual and developmental disabilities, and you'll hear more in the next panel about why that is so difficult. Um, so what we are using right now for our estimates is the 19, let's say the 2016 National Health Interview Survey for children um, in that survey uh, that it asks parents, does your child have an intellectual disability? Does your child have an autism spectrum disorder? And does your child have a developmental delay? Altogether, um, there are 6.99% of all uh, children 0 to 17 years old um, have one of those three uh, conditions. Uh, if you look at, for adults, we don't have comparable data. Um, we haven't been able to do a good job of measuring uh, in prevalence of intellectual and developmental disabilities in adults since the 1994-1995 National, National Health Interview Survey Disability Supplement. So we're still using the figure from that. We know that it's probably not accurate, but it's the best we have right now. So um, we're estimating that about 0.8% uh, uh, of adults have either intellectual disabilities or developmental disabilities as defined in the Developmental Disabilities Act, which is a very significant level of disability, um, significant limitations in three or more areas. Um, so uh, this, on the other side of the slide, uh, you can see our estimate for 2016. We estimate 7.37 million people in the United States had intellectual or developmental disabilities. The blue box, the blue lines, uh, are the people who are known to state IDD agencies, about 20% of those people. And the, the people who are in green um, are the people who get long-term supports and services through state agencies, and that's 17% in 2016. So this is where um, the complexity grows. Um, what I've done is I've put together just a comparison of um, looking at what's happening for kids, what's happening for adults, and what's the impact of using the 2016 NHIS and its definitions versus using the 1994-95 NHIS-D and its definitions for identifying people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So in the US population, um, 73 million uh, people are children, or 23% of the full population. Um, in our estimates of prevalence, however, 70% of the people that we identify as having IDD using those two data sources are kids. Now, that doesn't seem uh, like it could possibly be right, and it's probably not. Um, we're probably measuring apples and oranges. We, we're measuring um, children who have a, any developmental delay against adults who have very significant intellectual or developmental disabilities that require lifelong supports. So, but that's where we're at. That's the challenge. So of the people known to state ID agencies, 39% are kids. 
Um, and part of the reason that that number is as low as it is is because some state IDD agencies do not serve children. Their children with intellectual disabilities are served in a different branch of state government that we don't survey. Um, and then in terms of kids and adults living in congregate settings or settings with four or more people together, um, only 6% of the people in congregate settings are children versus um, uh, the 240,000 adults who live in those settings. So the, the challenge here is we know that there's some problems in um, each of these numbers in terms of what they mean, but the caution is be really careful when you're looking at states in the risk project data um, and comparing those states. You need to be aware of whether they serve children or not and what percentage of the people they serve are children in order to correctly interpret the other findings in the report. So this is just our current um, picture of where people who receive services live. Amy showed you an estimate on um, all people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, whether they get services or not. 58% of those people who get services live with a family member. 12% uh, uh, live in their own home, 5% in a foster home. 7% live in a group home that has three or fewer people. 11% uh, in a group home of four to six people, 4% 4 4 in seven to 15 people, and just 3% live in an, uh, a setting of um, 16 or more now. We're, we're a much, very small number of people in those settings, um, but there are still a good number of people who are in, in institutions, even though it's a small percentage, we, I'm not willing to say, well, we don't need to track them anymore because there's just a few of them left. Um, as long as we still have people living in institutions um, as their main um, place of being, we will continue to need to, to look at how many of those people there are. So um, uh, we saw some state comparisons um, about uh, differences across states. The average uh, number or percentage of, of people who are receiving services, mostly Medicaid funded services, um, live with a family member, it's about 58% overall. But the range is from 8% in Maryland to 87% in Arizona. What is going on here? What's going on here is Arizona has managed care waiver um, and they serve lots and lots of kids on their managed care waiver. Maryland doesn't serve kids. This is 18 to 20. The only people that are in um, that are in the 18 to 21 year old group are the ones that are showing up here. 8% uh, of the total um, population. So um, this is a very important piece to keep in mind as you're thinking about um, comparing states. It, you can't say that Arizona is great state and Maryland is a bad state. It's not about that. It has to do more with the service delivery system. So we've already looked at some changes over time in the expenditures. This is a look at, at changes over time in the recipients within ICF and waiver um, services only for intellectual and developmental disabilities. You can see that um, the number of people getting services in home and community-based settings uh, exceeded the number of people living in ICF settings in 1995, a little bit earlier than the expenditures. Uh, switched. Um, we are now at the, at the point where there's 807,000 people receiving home and community-based services and 74,000 living in institutions. Again, 74,000 is a much smaller number than what we at one time had, but it's still a, a good number of people. So um, this is just a, a quick look at waiting lists, and, and it's, it's an opportunity to, to see how, what's the trend overall in terms of are we serving people who've identified that they need services and um, that states uh, either are or are not able to serve them. So in 1996, there were um, 291,000 people getting services and 87,000 people um, who were waiting for services. Uh, the 2016 numbers are quite a bit different than that with 800,000 people receiving services and 193,000 waiting for services. And I'm just looking for my number here. So uh, the ratio between those um, receiving services and those waiting for services has declined from 30% in 1996 to 24% in 2016. There's been a great uh, gr movement of, of growth in terms of serving families um, of children and because they're less expensive to serve, um, but also because that's where a lot of the, the kids are. And as that, um, as Medicaid ICF, or Medicaid HCBS services have been delivered to that population, we have been able to reduce the waiting lists uh, compared to the number of people served. 
So the risk project is not primarily an expenditures project. We really only do expenditures for two specific categories of services. One is the ICF um, program, and one, the other is for H home and community-based services uh, under Medicaid. But there is some interesting information that we can talk about from, from what we do. We started asking states in um, 2014 to, do, to tell us how many uh, adults versus how many kids were getting services and, and how much money was being spent for adults versus kids. And here you can see a summary of what we've learned. Overall, the, the two sets of bars to the right compare um, people receiving waiver-funded services to people receiving ICF-funded services. Um, the difference is enormous. It's much more expensive per, day, per person per year to serve a person in an intermediate care facility for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities than it is to serve them in a home and community-based setting. Um, but the other part of this graph that's really important to look at is you can't really understand those differences within waiver between adult and kids unless you also know the difference between where people are living. So um, most kids live with their families. Kids living in family setting, living with their family members, um, cost an average of $13,000 or $14,000 a year. Um, kids who are living in any other setting cost about $37,000 a year. Um, on the other hand, adults um, are higher than children in, in both cases, with $26,000 a year for adults living in the family home and $72,000 a year for adults living in any other setting who receive home and community-based waiver um, services. It has to do with the number of hours of direct support that are paid for by Medicaid. Um, so the um, p families, when people live with their family members, the families provide a lot of un uncompensated care. Um, and so it doesn't cost as much to serve, to provide services in that setting because you're not serving people 24 hours a day, seven days a week. People who live in a residential setting require um, 24, many times require 24 hour services, uh, which is quite a bit more expensive. Amy showed you this graph already, um, the, 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 the uh, mountain picture of state-operated large institutions, uh, where we um, have been and where we're going. Um, I just wanted to, um, as I close out, point, to you, point you to a few resources that are available. In addition to the reports that are available on the table for you, um, we have a robust set of information on our website. Um, you, can at, you can access our report in a PDF um, format on our, uh, on our website at risp.umn.edu. You can also um, take a, a look and do interactive visualizations. So um, in this case, we were looking at the state of Maryland and we're, we're selecting um, certain years to look at what's the distribution of where people live across those years. The picture on the right is our new 2017 state profile, um, and it shows for a particular state trends over time in the places that people live, in the average expenditures per person, um, and in the number of people served by state agencies. Um, we continue to build additional visualizations and infographics um, for, uh, to, to try to inf uh, give people what the information that they need, a little bit like what Andrew asked for at lunchtime. We keep asking people, how can we tell you better what we're doing and what we know? And um, so I'd be interested to see what feedback um, that was given to um, Andrew about that at, at today's um, lunch session. Um, let me just show you one other thing, and then I'm, I, I am at the end of my time. Um, this is a, a U.S. map showing the proportion of state-operated IDD facilities in a state that have closed. So we have, um, uh, let's see, where was my numbers here? Uh, 15 states in 2016 had closed all of their uh, all of their large state-operated institutions, and those are the ones in, in uh, gray stripes. But interestingly, or importantly, um, there are also a number of states that haven't closed any of their state IDD facilities, including Iowa, Wisconsin. Some of these are little states, some of them are not. Um, and so there is still work to be done in terms of the deinstitutionalization process. Sometimes um, 
We want to move beyond the institutionalization and talk about other things, but I will tell you the question I get most often from reporters um, and from others asking for information is where are we at in deinstitutionalization, what are the issues, um, and what do we need to do about it. So as long as we continue to have um, state-operated facilities or large facilities uh, across the United States, there will continue to have a discussion about deinstitutionalization, what we know about it. We know a lot of things about it. We know that, that people have better lives when they move, but um, there still is a debate in, every, in all of the states where institutions live, uh, are, are, where our institutions are open, about whether they should stay open or not, and families trying to argue that that's really the only place, the long-term place, the place I want my child to live um, when I'm not here anymore. So on that note, um, we are... Um, doing a special study this year in collaboration with Coleman Center um, and our research and training center on community living on intentional communities because what we're seeing is, um, yes, the state-operated ICF model uh, institutions are downsizing and closing, but we have a whole new set of, of institutions that are emerging and um, we're trying to get a handle on what those are. A lot of those are emerging parents of kids who have autism who don't qualify for IDD services, want a place for their kid to live, so they're building a neighborhood, a cluster of homes, a farmstead, or another kind of intentional community, and that's the next uh, piece that we'll be watching on the horizon. So. Contact information is here, and um, thank you for your time. Kirsten Rowe with the Virginia VR Agency. Um, I've got a question for John Butterworth. I, I, you mentioned um, workforce development program or system data, and I'm curious to know what kinds of data you're talking about. Um, we tap, there's uh, not very detailed workforce data, but we tap some of the data that's available from the workforce system on um, access, access to one stops, um, the databases that track use of those services by people with disabilities. We've at times looked at um, sources of referral into the voc rehab system, though that's, I don't think, as reliable for us as a way to understand um, the impact of the workforce development system. It's um, not a core data set for us because our focus is on folks with IDD and we can't you know, bring it down to that level, and it's such crude data that comes from the workforce system, but it's from the national um, publicly available data sets from workforce. So um, I can always come up with questions. So uh, Sherry, um, uh, Cheryl, um, Sherry, Cheryl, gosh. Well, if you know me by my writing, you know me by, as Cheryl, and if you know me in person, you know me by Sherry. Yeah, I've heard <laughs> both, gosh. I thought I knew which one was right. Um, so uh, in terms of, you know, you, you, there's a, the degree to which people require services, right? And so uh, you would hope we'd know a way of diagnosing the degree to which people require services and perhaps people who are in home and community-based waiver programs living in with family members uh, don't require as many services or as many hours of services. Um, do you get a sense of the degree of severity between the, the two and whether people are actually in the setting that is best for them given their needs? Because having somebody in the home might actually be a really bad thing if they require a lot of services. It may be a really good thing if they don't require the full set of services that a, that a more institutional setting would provide. 
provide. So do you, do you get a sense of how good the fits are? Is there a way? So a deep, a deep dive into that topic would require going into the National Core Indicator Survey because that in that survey we have information about not only what diagnosis people have but also um, indicators of the kinds of limitations that they have and where they live. So you could answer that question with some certainty. Um, looking at, at national core indicators data, I don't have that data in front of me. But what I will say is, um, and this is from the work that we've done on deinstitutionalization, de is that um, there isn't anybody living in an institution today that doesn't have an analog person living in a family home or a community home and community-based setting um, in some other state. Remember, 15 states have closed all of their state-operated institutions, so whoever it was that was being served in those places are now being served in home and community-based settings. The bigger issue about people living with families, especially amongst adults, is um, People who are living in family homes and they like living in family homes are in great shape until the family, their family member dies and then we have a need to provide services to them. But by that time they could be 70 years old and our service delivery system is, um, was built around kids because it, it, early on uh, the people who were receiving services were kids. Now people are all ages, uh, lifespan has grown immensely and we have to change how we do our services so that we can meet those needs of people who, who are leaving family homes at a much later age than in the past. So I don't know if that answers, but. Not seeing any other hands, I'll keep asking questions, sorry. Um, oh, David has a Thank you, and as a father of a person on the spectrum, I appreciate all of your work and value it. Uh, one of the things I'm curious is, has there been any thought into attitudinal type of surveys, uh, surveying the general population on how they feel about this population? I'm very interested in that. And then additionally, in terms of aging in, uh, as you, to spin off of what you were just saying, we know that as people age, they get additional disabilities. Has there been any work done to the IDD population in terms of mobility challenges or hearing challenges or vision challenges that they then encounter later in life? Yeah, I'll take a, uh, an initial stab at the, the second part of your question. I would be looking to the folks at the University of Illinois at Chicago um, who do quite a bit of work on aging within the community of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Remind me of your first question, because I did have a response to that, too. Attitudinal? Uh, so the, you know, there, has been a, there was a study um, done, uh, actually two, two rounds, um, done 25 years apart by the Minnesota Developmental Disabilities Council looking at community attitudes. They um, hired a company to come in and, and do that. Um, and if you go to the Minnesota Developmental Disabilities Council website, um, you should be able to access those uh, reports so that you can actually see how have the attitudes changed over the last 20 years. Um, you may have to put in a request to them. Um, it may not be possible to easily find that report because it's several years old now, but there is a report that was done, at least in Minnesota. I don't know um, if people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are identifiable in any of the national surveys that have looked at that question. I just make a brief comment from the employment perspective. Uh, I, there is research on business attitudes, both at a, at a coworker level and at a business level um, that's specific to folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities. There's obviously the Kessler Foundation work on, on cross-disability kinds of issues. And I, to me, what's overwhelming about that is there's an overwhelming myth on the service side that businesses are resistant, uncomfortable, you know, when you engage with businesses, I don't think that plays out. It doesn't play out in the research. <laughs> it doesn't play out in the relationships that I've been part of building with businesses. Um, it, it's a myth that's held on the service side. I think that the attitudinal and expectation issues um, are more internal to the service system, like that data I showed about people having goals for employment as part of the service plan, um, than it is out there in the community. And just to add my two cents, I mean, yes, there are a number of studies that have been done um, with relation to attitudinal barriers for people with ID in the community, um, but no, not at the national level that I'm aware of, but there are, have been a number of journal, journal articles that have been done over, over years. Yeah, 
there actually have been some, there has been some work in healthcare situations, healthcare settings, oh, uh -huh. looking at the attitudes of physicians and how that affects access to healthcare. That's the, that would be the piece that I would be able to dig out an article or two on for you. Uh, this question is for John um, and anyone else who has uh, information. So in terms of uh, uh, supported and integrated employment, um, one of the things that the Kessler Foundation survey found was that job sharing was something they weren't, uh, they weren't doing and they didn't think would be feasible. Um, and you say that the hours are, de are, are depressed and that could be for multiple reasons. Um, are, do you find that people, okay, so two questions. Uh, uh, three questions. So is there any data on job sharing, which I'm probably is no. Uh, there may be some anecdotal here and there uh, in terms of which the, the person does, the two, two or more people uh, do the same job. Um, uh, is that something that is generally uh, used as a device uh, to, to increase employment? Uh, that's the second question. And then the third question is, uh, places like Washington, have they been able to break out of the four Fs, food, filth, flowers, and filing? Um, and if so, what industries, because, and you may have done this in your past research about what industries are, are the better, the states with the better outcomes, mm -hmm. apparently. Are they going to bet different industries or are the industries really just powerful and, you know, there's a lot of food, filth, and flowers in Washington. I, I don't know if that's the case. <laughs> Um, I don't know of any research that specifically addresses job sharing, but I would say that um, effective employment support um, involves um, negotiating and customizing jobs, which is closely related to the idea of job sharing. Um, you know, so places that are doing a better job, both at an individual kind of support provider level and at a larger state level, are states that have better expertise about creating the right kind of conversation with an employer. So you don't walk in and say, do you have a job for this person? Do you have any openings? You walk in and get to understand the company and what their needs are. You build jobs around that that are a good match to someone that you're supporting. I think that idea of customized employment um, is very closely aligned with the idea of job sharing. Um, and, uh, and that is a key strategy in our work. Um, that goes back, though we didn't frame it quite as specifically, I mean, it goes back to the early days of supported employment um, and the ideas of job carving, job creation, but we've become much more refined about in recent years. Um, I forget what your last question was, Andrew. The four Fs. Um, I'd kind of say this, I'd answer this sort of the way Sherry answered one of the earlier questions. There are a lot of good examples of people working in non-traditional jobs. We are still mostly finding people jobs in the easy places to find. I think the extent to which you approach your relationship building with employers with a customized approach and starting with a relationship and understanding the needs of the business, yeah. uh, not understanding them as an employer, understanding them as a business and what they need, um, you're more likely to build those kinds of jobs. We still, uh, one of the other areas we are doing research in and collect data in is what employment specialists do. Um, and when we collect data on what they do, the majority of the time they spend in job development is still cold calling and reading want ads. We haven't broken our workforce out of those behaviors yet. Um, so a lot of that has to do with the skills of the workforce and, um, and the kind of strategies that are being used as we reach out to the business community. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting, you know, because um, when I think of just anecdotally, you know, I'll see people doing similar jobs and, and you know, they're all dishwashers, so that could be job sharing in a way um, and, you know, using just a few hours a, a week um, kind of stay busy time, not necessarily yeah. a, a, a job that provides them with, with kind of uh, self-gratifying uh, experiences, but that maybe you're, that's not for me to judge, I guess. Um, and, uh, you know, with the Kessler Foundation work and also the earlier ODEP work, there, and it might bear out in the new one, one of the findings was worker safety. They had worker safety was, that was a new question, and then it was nature of the job. 
right? Yeah. And a lot of times that's multitasking. That multitasking, we can't carve out jobs because they have to run the register, they have to push carts, they have to stock the shelves. So local retail, it's you, know, you might see two people in a store uh, in a CVS or three people um, outside the pharmacy. Uh, and it's that kind of job carving that becomes more difficult uh, with multitasking and with um, oh, um, multitasking and uh, uh, a lot of like fire safety, all those other ones were uh, emergency uh, uh, danger, actual physical potential for yeah. physical danger for anybody, uh, let alone the person with disability. And so you still see that as a high issue and, and that actually might discuss, that might actually reveal some bias about what the assumptions are. Uh, I, that's more of a statement. I think it does honest. and I think that comes back to kind of knowledge having having had experience working with people and again back to the kind of conversation we have as we engage the business community um, I think that I that issue of people's need to multitask um, is one of many factors I think there are other bigger factors is one of many factors in the issue of people working fewer hours because if you're carving a job in a place like that they may have a need for someone to do something to relieve, to keep people on the register, relieve some of that other yeah. pressure on their time, um, but it may not be a full-time job. You know, they may need three hours a day of stocking or, or something else that uh, is gonna make the business work as a whole. Okay, we have a question over here. Um, this is a question probably for all the panelists, but also for Kathy as the moderator. Um, and it relates to variability among families and so, uh, one way of looking at that relates to race and ethnicity. So I think the question for Kathy is whether as an agency you get requests to have data cut by race, ethnicity, and then I'm wondering whether each of the data systems um, has the capacity to do that and whether you report out on that on a regular basis. As of yet, we don't get many requests for data to be cut by race and since today I want to ask you that the office of minority yeah. I mean, no. Well, okay, to be fair, like, I, they haven't called me personally, <laughs> although they're welcome to, but to answer the question, I mean, yes, we do, we do uh, have inquiries about race and ethnicity um, and also county level data, but for us, and I'm, I'm assuming this is going to be pretty similar answers across the board, we're only really able to reproduce the data that we're provided. And we get, we get our data from the state level folks. And some states are different than others. Some states have more information than others. Um, so it really for us comes down to what they have. Um, and you know we try to add new variables in, um, but that's not always a guarantee that every state is gonna be able to provide information for those variables. I, I mean, we have a little more access to that in, in the employment data sets we work with. One of the one of the things, Andrew, that actually you showed yesterday that struck me the most was um, when you showed the disparity in employment rates for people who are white versus other, uh, for folks without disabilities, and that those disparities dropped out when you looked at disability. Um, and that's very consistent with some analysis we're doing right now on data sets that we've got. Um, focused on that issue as one of our special studies, Kathy. But, um, so we're, stay tuned, because we're doing some of that analysis now, but um, kind of consistent with what you found in that slide you showed yesterday, Andrew, um, there's not that much difference. And I, you didn't really talk much about how you interpreted that, but I guess my interpretation would be that the presence of the disability sort of overwhelms yeah. the, the race and ethnicity differences yeah. um, in the outcomes. I would have two responses to your question. One, um, when we added age, just children and adults, 22 uh, and older versus birth to 21, it took states four years 
to be able to report that new data element. The, 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 the time and effort it would take for states to be able to report on race and ethnicity um, me, makes it a very difficult um, justification um, to collect that information at the state level on stuff. We did try within the RISC project to add race and ethnicity when, to the survey that we do every year of the remaining state institutions. Um, and we were, with, even with that, uh, even when you're talking to a specific facility, uh, they couldn't answer the question very well. Um, I don't know, exactly understand what the problem is. You have 100 people that you serve, how many of them are in these groups? That seems like a pretty basic question, but we really struggled and we had, to drop, we had to drop that question even off of the survey that was going directly to providers. Um, but the other answer to your question is, um, we, we know different things about race and ethnicity in developmental disabilities, depending on what disability you have uh, and depending on how old you are. We know a lot about race, race and ethnicity for eight-year-old children with autism. <laughs> because there's, every year there, is, there are reports out of the Adam Project that talk about that and there's a good summary of that. We know much less about um, adults, we know much less about intellectual and developmental disabilities other than autism. Um, the, the place I would look if you really want to know about that, I would be calling um, Human Services Research Institute um, or calling an analyst that uses the National Core Indicators because race and ethnicity data are available there. That is a um, random sample of the participating states um, of people who are receiving home and well, waivers of people who are receiving Medicaid funded services. Some states include both ICF and HCBS services. Some states only include one or the other. So you have to know the, the sample frame uh, in order to interpret the results. But there is data within, at the individual level, that's the value of the National Core Indicators itself, is that you can look at in people uh, as individuals and look at the demographic characteristics and see how they, how they differ in terms of outcomes. I would like to add something to that, just um, in defense of the states, because I don't, I don't mean it to sound like anything bad, but, but you know, we, we asked them for this data, and this is pro bono for them. I mean, this is something that they provide to us without any kind of compensation other than a pat on the back and a thank you. Um, so I want to be clear that it's understood that there are not, um, they don't get monetary value from it. and so. Um, that could be one of the reasons limiting their ability to have certain yeah. data sets. Yeah, and it's not central to their, their mission right. many times. All right, well, thank you very much to the panel. And uh, we're going to take a brief break, and then we'll hear from the other group on uh, related to intellectual and developmental disabilities data. Thank you very much. Thank you.